All right, it's good to see all of you here for our Sunday morning Bible class. We're going to begin uh, today in Matthew chapter 3. And we've studied uh, about the first five or six verses. And we're going to move on into chapter 3 and finish it hopefully pretty quickly and go on into chapter 4. So we're glad that you're here and hope that you have a good rainy day today. And you've only got three more days to be very well behaved. So after that, you just do whatever you want, you know. Christmas is upon us. We're so glad for this time of year and hope everyone has a safe travel as you go and visit with your families. And I hope that you have a very Merry Christmas. In Matthew chapter 3, we've talked about several different things. Now, I want to ask you a series of questions to sort of see where you're at this morning. If you're like me, I'm still in the bed over there, but uh, at any rate, what does Matthew use to prove that Jesus is the Messiah? Now, before you say something, I'll give you a hint here. John, in the book of John, he uses miracles to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. But what does Matthew use? The Old Testament scriptures. You're exactly right. He said over and over again in the book of Matthew, you're going to see this phrase, uh, this is that which was spoken by the prophet. You'll find this even in the first five chapters. I, I'm just guessing maybe ten times. Okay, it is over and over and over again. In fact, in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, uh, it's mentioned quite a bit. Okay? I'll just give you some quick references. Uh, chapter 1, verse 22. Uh, chapter 2, verse 5. Chapter 2, verse 15. Chapter 2, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 3. And chapter 4, verse 14. I mean, it just goes on and on. This is that which was spoken by the prophet. All right, now, let me ask you this. Who was John the Baptist? Okay, yes, he was Jesus' cousin. What can you tell me about him? What was his job? Yeah, I hear, okay. Prepare the way. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Prepare the way, okay. Uh, now, I've got a question to ask you, though. Did he establish the Baptist church? No. In fact, if you look at his name, you'll see the original word here in the Greek language. I put some English letters there for you so you can read it. Baptistes. John the baptizer. Okay, uh, literally it describes what he was doing, not who he is. Okay, sometimes we get confused. We read that in the Bible. It says John the Baptist. Well, his name has been somewhat abused, okay? Uh, his name is John, but what he was doing, he was baptizing people, and he was baptizing a lot of people. He came with the name John the Baptizer, and it was translated John the Baptist. Okay? So, uh, anyway, you read a lot of things about him in the Bible. Um, you can see here, his job was to prepare the way for Jesus. Now, I was going to go into this, but I'm not going to do it today. You'll read about John and some prophecies from the book of Malachi about John, okay? Malachi prophesied about John the Baptist. So did uh, Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40. But it's interesting to me that in the book of Malachi, it said he would come in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. Now, Elijah is long before John the Baptist, way long. You're talking about the book of 1st and 2nd Kings. But Elijah was a very powerful prophet, and he was uh, somewhat of a, a country boy. He lived out in the wilderness. He didn't shave, you know. He probably smelled pretty bad, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's it may be. He, he lived in a desert place, okay. He was a real outdoors, and he lived off the land type guy. Elijah and John the Baptist are very similar in that way. In fact, the Bible says about John, if you remember, uh, what did he eat? Locusts and wild honey. And I wonder about them locusts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's probably more like a grasshopper, okay? But at any rate, that's, that's what he lived off of. That was, that was his diet. 
You know, today it would be more like coon and possum, all right? Squirrels. You just live off of whatever is there to eat. And that's what he had to eat. Okay, now let me ask you this, okay? We talked about who is John. Uh, we talked about what Matthew used. But let's talk about who is Jesus. Let's look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 3. Will somebody read that for us? Okay, so he was to prepare the way for who? The Lord. When you go back to Isaiah's account, now keep in mind, he's quoting Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. Okay, Matthew just quoted that word for word, and he said, this is the one who is preparing the way for the Lord, talking about John the Baptist. Now, when you read Isaiah's account, it says, prepare ye the way in the wilderness, the way of Jehovah. The King James says, Lord, capital L-O-R-D. Now that's very important. I'll share with you something. This is uh, from the Watchtower Society. Okay? They do not believe that Jesus is God. I want to share a little bit with you before we go on says here that uh, Jesus himself referred to his Father as the only true God, John 17, 3. Jesus is spoken of in the Scriptures as a God or even as a mighty God. But nowhere is he spoken of as being almighty as Jehovah. Is that true or false? That's false. Because in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, it clearly speaks of Jesus as being Jehovah. So you have to be careful, okay? Be careful what's out there. Uh, not everything that we're reading is true. The sad truth is this group does not believe that Jesus is God in the flesh. Uh, their reasoning is, how can there be more than one? So they do not believe in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Which is kind of a sad thing because in Matthew chapter 3, we're going to read on in just a little while. And we're going to see they're all three present when Jesus is baptized. Okay, all three of them are there and they are active. Okay, so that's a little bit of review of what we talked about last week. And we'll move on. And, you know, John, he made some enemies along the way. All right, he made some enemies along the way. And you look there in Matthew chapter 3, let's begin in uh, verse 7, okay? Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Now, before we do that, I want to share with you some quotes that I found. I, th I thought those were pretty, pretty funny and pretty interesting. One guy said, you know, uh, I killed an enemy soldier by cutting off his feet, which means I defeated him. <laughs> well, one guy, he said, resentment is like poison. It's hoping it will kill the enemy, but it only kills you. Is that true? Most times it is. Somebody said this, it's better to make a mistake in forgiving than to make one in punishing. Is that true? You know, John made some enemies along the way, and the Bible calls them... The Pharisees and the Sadducees. Let's read here, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. But when he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. And I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees, and therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Who are the Pharisees and the, Sad the Sadducees? Well, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. That's right. The Pharisees, I don't know about them. Okay, yeah, that's true. 
Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection after death. And they did not also believe in angels, which is sort of weird to be religious and not believe in the resurrection. You know, if I didn't believe in the resurrection, I'd just do whatever I wanted. I wouldn't be at church today, I'll tell you that right now. I'd be out doing something else, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Why not? You know, the Bible says, for those who do not believe in God, let them eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow they die. You might as well just do whatever you want to do. I don't ever understand the position of the Sadducees. Now, when you think about the different religious groups of that day, who are the Pharisees? Can you mention a man who was a Pharisee? The Apostle Paul was formerly a Pharisee. He said, of the chiefest sect of my religion, of my father's. So this was a very strict religious Jewish group. Okay? Uh, they were the ones who loved the greetings in the marketplaces and they walked around with their broad garments and they appeared to be holy, he said. And they loved to be called Rabbi, Rabbi. I found these scriptures, I'll share them with you before we move on. About the Pharisees, Paul said about himself when he's pleading his defense. He said, my manner of life from my youth, which was from the beginning of my own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. He said, I, I know all of them. Those are my kin folks, he said. Having knowledge of me from the first, if they are willing to testify that after the straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. You know what he's saying? He said, I was a very religious person and I was religiously wrong. That's his whole defense. He said, because I saw Jesus with my own eyes and I learned about something even more powerful than my religion. And he, and he realized that he was wrong. So that's his defense in Acts chapter 26. Then you go back a little bit and you read about the Sadducees. It says, when he uh, had said... There arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of what John is dealing with when he begins to preach. <laughs> You've got such different views religiously of what these people believe and he begins to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And all of a sudden, it's like a bee's nest has been disturbed. All right, let's move on. Let's talk about the baptism of Jesus. Okay? Look here in verse 13. Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Then comes Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Is baptism a popular topic in the Bible? Yeah, I think in the Lord's church we get this reputation for only believing in baptism in the Bible, you know. It's like uh, one, one preacher, he stood up to preach and he said, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water, which brings me to my subject, baptism. <laughs> well, friend, baptism is a, is a subject in the Bible, but it's not the only subject in the Bible. But I will tell you this, a lot of times I feel like preachers in the Lord's church have focused a lot of attention on it, mainly because people in the religious world have sort of disregarded it. How many baptisms are in the Bible? 
Can you name some? Okay. That's what the Bible says, right? It says there is only one baptism. But you do read about other baptisms in the Bible. For instance, um, look there in Matthew chapter 3. Somebody read verse 11. As for me, I baptized you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier, mightier than I, and I am not fit to remain the same. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay. Baptism of the Holy Spirit. Baptism with fire. Baptism with water. You have three that are mentioned right there, right? There's some others in the Bible. I mean, you think about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 2, he said, They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. When he, he's talking about they crossed the Red Sea, they had a wall of water on either side and they had a cloud above them. And he said, he specifically used the word baptism. He said they were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Well, then in Mark chapter 10, you may remember that, that they told the Lord, they said, we'll go anywhere you go. Wherever you go is where we'll go. And he said, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? He's talking about this, the baptism of suffering, to be murdered. That's what he asked him. Are you willing then to die on a cross like I am? You think about John's baptism. Mark chapter 1. You know, and specifically in Acts chapter 18 and verse 25, he said they were baptized under John's baptism. They had to be rebaptized because it was not the correct way by that term. Jesus had already been resurrected after that. Then you read about the baptism of Jesus, what we're reading about now in Matthew chapter 3. Read about the baptism of fire, baptism of the Holy Spirit, and then, of course, the baptism for the remission of sin. So, what does all that mean? Let's go to Ephesians chapter 4, and then I'll continue. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 4 through 6. All right, will somebody read that, please? Okay. There's only one baptism. What does that mean then? We just read about seven. What are your thoughts? I'll give you my answer. It may not mean a lot, but I'll, I'll tell you what I think about it. What he means is there's only one baptism that saves. There's only one baptism for the remission of sins. And let me tell you, the baptism of Moses is not it. All the other baptisms are mentioned are not today to apply the blood of Christ to your life. Except for one. It's mentioned in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 when he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, you read in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21 where it specifically says, Baptism doth also now save us. But in the previous verse he said they were saved by water. You see, the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not save a person. The baptism of fire, of course, does not save a person. That condemns a person. <laughs> the baptism of Jesus, to my knowledge, that we're reading about in Matthew chapter 3, it was not for the remission of sins. Did Jesus have any sins? In fact, he told us the reason why he was baptized. He said, 
to fulfill all righteousness. You know what that means? How many of you have children? Okay. Do you think it would be right for you and me to tell our children not to smoke, but we smoke? But yeah, it's a good idea, but they're probably not going to listen. You know? We puffing on a cigarette, we say, you know, you should never smoke. <laughs> you know, my parents did that. And it didn't work. Can you believe the summer after fourth grade I started smoking? How old are you? Ten? In the fourth grade? Ten years old. <clears throat> That's a baby. My son, my son is 10. That's what my parents did. They said, oh, you shouldn't smoke. I think when I was 11 years old or so, the manager at the skating rink caught me smoking. And he pulled me inside and he called my parents and he said, did you know your son was smoking outside? He knew. I was so small. He said, no, I'm going to call his parents. So my dad came and picked me up and he picked up a pack of cigarettes on the way home and he made me smoke every single one of them until I got sick. I was just a baby. But my parents always wondered, you know, why, why is he so rebellious? Why is he acting this way? And I look back at my childhood and I think, well, I wonder why. You know, wonder why. Jesus said, I will never expect you to do something that I will not do myself. So you say, well, why in the world was Jesus baptized? You know, he, he didn't need to be baptized. Well, no, of course he didn't. <laughs> and John asked him, why are you being baptized? Jesus said, to fulfill all righteousness. He said, I am setting the standard right now here today. From this point on, people need to be baptized. In fact, it even gets more serious after the resurrection of Christ because on Acts chapter 2, when they said, what do we need to do? He told them, repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Even John the Baptist was baptizing for the remission of sins before Jesus was resurrected. So, baptism is an important subject. I think it's somewhat abused, but it can be overdone, in my opinion. But Jesus himself thought it was necessary to do it. So if Jesus thought it was necessary, you better believe I'm going to think it's necessary too. All right, let's go to chapter 4. All right? Uh, I want to mention one thing before we go on. Uh, sometimes there are religious groups, they do not believe in the Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But interestingly enough, you look here in Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized, notice verse 16. It says, Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. Okay, that's one. And the heavens were open unto him, and the Spirit of God descending like a dove. That's two. And a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved Son, whom I'm well pleased. That's three. All three of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are not only mentioned in the Bible by name, but they are present when Jesus is baptized. All right, let's go on. Chapter 4. This is a very good chapter in my opinion. One of my favorite chapters. Um, I have a lot of favorite chapters, but to me... This is very applicable for you and me. Because it's interesting that Jesus goes straight from the water to where? The wilderness. Where he is tempted. You read on in chapter 4 and he begins his ministry. So he goes from the water to the wilderness to the work. Friend, that's you and my life as a Christian every day. 
That's it. We've obeyed the gospel, right? And, and the first thing the devil's going to do, he's going to try to pull us away. <laughs> and he's going to try hard for those first couple years, isn't he? And I'll tell you this, he is very successful a lot of times. You think about all the baptisms that this congregation has had in the last three or four years. It's a lot. How many of those people have stayed? Not many. Maybe 10%. Maybe 10% will stay. You see, because the devil is very, very good at what he does. All right, let's begin chapter 4. Uh, there's several things we want to mention here uh, about Jesus and being tempted in the wilderness. Uh, there was a preacher. He visited a girl's family, and the little, little girl had a tummy ache. And anyway, um, she told the preacher when he sat down, she said, my tummy hurts. He said, well... Tell you what, we're going to eat in just a minute. Maybe it hurts because there's nothing in there. So anyway, they sat down. They ate their meal together. And, you know, uh, after dinner, they came back and sat down. That little girl crawled up next to him. And he leaned over. He said, you know what? My head hurts. She said, well, that's probably because there's nothing in there. It's interesting to me how Jesus defeated the devil. What, what three words did he use? It is written. The more knowledge we have in here, the more effective it will be here. You know, this is called the sword of a spirit. And a man who's a soldier, if he's trained with a sword, he's got to train every day. And in my opinion, it helps if Christians do the same thing. It's hard to defeat the devil. You ever thought of times in your life where you were being overcome and you had to fight a little bit harder? You say, man, things are not going my way. I've got to train a little bit more. I've got to get back in the Word. You see, even Jesus knew that principle and He used the Word of God as His weapon. He stored it in His mind and in His heart in order to defeat the devil. So that's chapter 4 in a nutshell. All right? So let's uh, talk about these two sections. We've got the temptation in the wilderness, and then uh, the second section here. Uh, I thought I had it there almost immediately. Uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll come to it in just a minute. Uh, the temptation in the wilderness and the time to work. That's the two sections of this chapter. All right, let's see what happens. Let's begin chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And the tempter came to him and said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. You think he was pretty hungry? I cannot imagine starving for 40 days. And I began to wonder, you know, is this complete starvation or is this like, did he eat just a little bit? I mean, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, but obviously he's very hungry. And the devil knew just what he wanted to do. Does the devil tempt you in the ways that you know you could be tempted easily? Sure, he does that to me too. He does it to all of us. You know, it's like a fisherman. If you want to catch a certain kind of fish, you've got to use the right bait. And Satan always knows the right bait. He said, okay. If you're as hungry as you think you are, let's see what you can do. Notice Jesus' answer. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but what? But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus is, is using something from the Old Testament. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. Now, it's pretty neat to me that Jesus knew this scripture by memory. You say, well, of course he did. He's the son of God. <laughs> but I don't think he's quoting this miraculously. I don't think when he was 12 years old and he was teaching in the temple when he was such a young boy, I don't think he was doing that miraculously. 
I think he was doing that because he spent all day every day reading and studying the Old Testament law. It helped him. That aspect of his life, it, it helped him defeat the devil. All right, so that's temptation number one. Let's go on to number two. Look at verse five. The devil takes him up to a, uh, into the holy city and he sets him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to them, if thou be the son of God. All right, it's the second time he said that. If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down. Now notice the devil can quote scriptures too. He quotes from the book of Psalms word for word. The devil said, it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Now he is quoting Psalm chapter 91, verses 11 and 12. Now I'm going to notice this just for a moment. It's interesting to me that in, I went back and looked. In Psalm chapter 91, David is singing a song about God's people. And about how God's people, God will provide for His people. He will protect His people. He will never leave them. And the devil took that and applied it to Jesus. So he says, if you really are one of God's people, you could jump off this temple and God would save you, wouldn't He? So let's see if God will really save you. Do you think the devil comes to people today and makes them doubt their salvation? He still does the same thing. I mean, think about it. He, he could be sitting next to you in your chair just causing you to think, man, am I, am I really going to heaven? I'm not good enough to go to heaven. I don't even deserve to sit in this pew this morning. He wants you to feel that way. Well, that's an age-old principle that the devil uses. I'll give you three of those in just a moment. Let's move on to number three. Jesus answered, It is written, verse 7, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again, the devil take them up to an exceeding high mountain, and he shows them all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, All these will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. You think the devil could do that? No. <laughs> well, I don't think the devil was no. too smart. No. If he had just thought, Jesus owned that already. Why he tithes, he's going to give it to him. That's right. The devil couldn't do that anyway. There's no way he could give him that. He doesn't have the power to give him that. But Jesus said to him, Get thee hence, Satan, notice, for it is written. That's the third time he answered him with three words. It is written, and he quoted scripture again, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now notice, the devil leaves him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. I want to share with you these principles I found, and then I'm going to make application and then close. Somebody said, opportunity knocks only once, but temptation leans on the doorbell. The only, way, the only way to get rid of temptation, someone said, is to yield to it. You know what he means? It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. Somebody said this, it's better to shun the bait then try escaping the trap. You know what Jesus is doing? He's shunning the bait. He's starting at the beginning before he gets trapped. Now, think about this. There are three ways that Satan tempted Jesus. How did he do this? That's right. The same three ways that John mentioned in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The devil uses these same three avenues and always has. Jesus was able to defeat the devil with the Word of God. Now, that's the key to this whole chapter. Okay, So, when you think, well, what's the key to the chapter here? It is the fact that Jesus was able to use the Word of God to defeat the devil. Now, I failed to mention this in the beginning. 
And I'm going to share this with you before we close today. What is the reason why God shared this story with us? Why would God share this story with us? I think, in my opinion, the reason why God is sharing this with us is to show us that we, too, can overcome the devil. That's it. I mean, you think about it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, I, I looked at several different versions of this, okay? And I wanted to share them with you to sort of give you an idea. This is, to me, an overview of Matthew chapter 4. It says this, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, I think some modern translations translate it a little bit better. Jesus understands every weakness of ours because he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. And I'll tell you, not only was Jesus tempted like me, he was tempted greater than me. Far greater. I have never been hungry for 40 days. Not one time. I've, I've never even really been that hungry. I mean, I've been a whole day, maybe half a day without eating just because, you know, you're out working, doing whatever. You say, man, I'm starving. That's all that's ever happened to me. Jesus was murdered and put on a cross, <clears throat> tortured for hours and hours and hours. When he himself not only could have come down from the cross, he could have destroyed the entire world. Not only was he tempted like me, he was tempted far greater than me. All right, thank you so much for your attention today.